Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of vast early America and publishers of the William and Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. To learn more about the William and Mary Quarterly and how you can enjoy some of the best scholarship on the vast world of early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 134 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Clergymen were important members of colonial American society. They stood as leaders of local churches, and they often held high status within many communities because they were often the most educated people in town. So, given their high trusted status within communities, we shouldn't at all be surprised by the fact that clergymen helped inform and lead public opinion in early America. After all, they had the ability to use their pulpits to both preach the word of God and also to convey ideas that built and sometimes divided communities. So what happened to these trusted, educated men during the American Revolution? How did they choose their political allegiances, and what work did they undertake to either aid or hinder the revolutionary cause? To help answer these questions, Spencer McBride, an editor at the Joseph Smith Papers Documentary Editing Project, joins us to explore some of the ways that politics and religion intersected during the American Revolution. And He's going to do this with details from his book, Pulpit and Nation, Clergymen and the Politics of Revolutionary America. Now, during our exploration, Spencer reveals how clergymen participated in politics before the revolution, how clergymen participated in politics during and after the revolution, and what early Americans thought about the fact that their clergymen were participating in politics. But first, I just wanted to say that I've been having a lot of fun meeting you at our meetups. It's really great to get to know more about you and find out what your interests are. So I'm going to host three more meetups this summer as conferences take me from Boston to Ann Arbor, Philadelphia, and Anaheim. So if you'd like to help me plan or participate in these casual and fun gatherings, be sure you join the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook or send me an email if you're not on Facebook. To join the community, text BF World to 33444 or click the orange Join Now button on the benfranklinsworld.com home screen. And as I've said, I think these gatherings are a lot of fun. We've had a lot of fun doing them. And I really hope our paths cross so we get to meet sometime this summer. Okay, are you ready to explore the roles clergymen and religion played during the American Revolution? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an editor at the Joseph Smith Papers Documentary Editing Project. His research focuses on the intersections of religion and politics during the American Revolution and early Republic periods, and today he joins us to explore some of those intersections with details from his book, Pulpit and Nation, Clergymen and the Politics of Revolutionary America. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's World, Spencer McBride. Thank you so much, Liz. Spencer We're glad you could rejoin us, because the last time we spoke with you, you told us all about Joseph Smith and the founding of Mormonism, and then you ended our conversation by teasing us a bit with details from your book in progress. And well, now your book is a book, so we have a new topic of conversation. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, but I'm thrilled to be able to uh, talk to audiences about this book finally. Well, why don't we dive into our discussion? At the start of Pulpit Nation, Spencer notes that Clergymen had a long history of being active in politics and that the American Revolution changed the nature of their political activity. Spencer, would you tell us how clergymen participated in politics before the revolution? Sure. As we look through colonial America, we see clergymen played a clear role in the politics of the individual colonies as well as in the communities within those colonies. And by the local politics, I mean elections of local officials and debates over local policy. Now, the nature of their involvement varied. Some colonies, such as Massachusetts, prohibited clergymen from holding public office. So we're not so much talking about 
individual seeking a combination of political and religious authority in a single person. That wasn't so common. But as well-educated men, as some of the best-educated men, really, in the colonies, clergymen were among the social elite in a time when it was common for colonial Americans to pay deference to their you know, so-called social betters. And so we see clergymen taking advantage of this influence that they had. Sometimes they would preach sermons that were directly on political issues, where they just came out and said what they thought and what the people should do. Sometimes in their preaching, it was more indirect. You know, they might pick a, a topic or a verse of scripture and preach on it without actually mentioning the political issue or the election that was being contested outside of the church doors. But they would do it in a way that anyone who was familiar with the question at hand would clearly see the connection. And so this was common throughout most of the colonies in this era. And then we come to the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, as it was known. And particularly in New England, we see clergymen not just preaching politics, but preaching about that war in ways and in terms that emphasize the importance of the American colonies as a group, as this almost united group, and also in a way that emphasized the significance of their place in the British Empire as a whole. And so we almost have this foreshadowing of what's coming with clergymen and politics and the Revolutionary War in the 1770s, that during the Seven Years' War, we see this kind of temporary continental political stage, or, you know, looking back, we might call it a proto-national political stage. It doesn't last, but in some ways, we're able to see the effectiveness of clerical preaching on political issues, particularly associated with war. Another thing we see in colonial politics is, while a clergyman may be preaching to his congregation, particularly momentous sermons, it was common for them to be published and then distributed throughout the colony. So in theory, and often in practice, a clergyman's audience for his politicized sermons could very easily extend beyond the walls of the chapel in which he preached. You mentioned that Massachusetts had laws that prohibited clergymen from holding political office. Did all of the colonies have such laws? No, not necessarily. But I think one of the things we see even in some of these you know, early periods of colonial America, at least among some segments of the population, there was still a little bit of uncertainty about combining political power and religious power in single persons, you know, so to have one individual possess both in that direct manner. And certainly as we get into late 18th and early 19th century American history, we see this uneasiness expand and kind of erupt in certain situations. Now that we have a baseline for how clergymen participated in politics before the revolution, would you tell us how the revolution changed clergymen's political participation? So we talked about how the Seven Years' War, we see kind of this temporary continental political stage. And what the revolution really did in some senses was create a lasting national political stage. We see this most clearly I think, with the formation of the Continental Congress in 1774 and then its annual reprisal thereafter. And this Congress had, as one of its main goals, to unite and mobilize the people of the different colonies to resist Great Britain. At first, the goal wasn't independence, but rather resistance to the imperial policies that they found so distasteful, so oppressive. But then once independence is declared, they still have this goal of how do we unite Americans around the revolutionary cause? How do we mobilize them to take action to bring about independence? And so we see this national political stage created in many ways through Congress. And starting in 1775, Congress really grants clergymen a prominent place on this new national political stage. And they do this by encouraging them to preach revolutionary politics from the pulpits of their respective churches. They do this by inviting clergymen to serve as chaplains in Congress, to begin congressional sessions with prayer, to preach to Congress on special occasions. We also see them granting this prominent place to clergymen as they invite them to take on chaplaincies in the Continental Army and expand the responsibilities they had beyond that of their British counterparts. And so what we see happening in effect is 
this alliance being forged between the Continental Congress and clergymen, where the clergymen in many ways become spokesmen for a kind of national perspective of the imperial crisis that became the American Revolution, and then eventually for independence itself. And in many ways, you know, this came about as the intentional and strategic invitation and planning of revolutionary leadership, both in Congress and in the army. Proclaiming fast days proved to be one of the Continental Congress's first invitations to clergymen to participate in the revolution. Spencer, would you tell us about the fast days that Congress proclaimed and what role clergymen played in these days? Yes, and this is actually the first chapter of my book because I think it's such a significant moment in the formation of this alliance between the clergy and the early national political leaders during the revolution. So fast days were proclaimed by Congress starting in 1775. And for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with this term, fast day, it's the shortened version of days of fasting and prayer. These were common occurrences in England, but also in New England, where men and women, when a fast day was proclaimed, would, of course, abstain from food and drink for whatever the designated period of time was, usually a day. And the fast day observance would usually include their attendance at a special worship service. And at that service, a special fast day sermon would be written and delivered by the clergyman and preached on that occasion. And we see at different times in colonial New England where this practice was really strongest in the colonies, that there were some early attempts to have fast days even weekly, which didn't go over so well. It was a little bit too much, sometimes to do it monthly, but usually we'd see it as an annual occurrence, almost like an annual holiday. And certainly a colonial governor could proclaim a fast day on special occasions. And what we see during the revolution is this practice of proclaiming days of fasting and prayer spreads throughout the continent. One of the most significant examples would be in 1774, when the House of Burgesses in Virginia declared a day of fasting and prayer in protest to the closing of Boston Harbor by the British as a consequence for, among other things, the Boston Tea Party. And they did this not just to protest the act, but they specifically picked something that was a ritual associated with New England as a way of demonstrating their solidarity with their sister colony. But what's fascinating about this is the Burgesses didn't actually know how to proclaim a fast day. They didn't understand the mechanics of it. And Thomas Jefferson, who was very much in favor of this and was then in the House of Burgesses, records that they actually had to go and search through their historical records to find a Puritan form of a fast day proclamation so they could know how to actually do this. And so when Congress picks up the practice in 1775, the intent is clear. They want to unite the colonists in a single religious ritual on the same day, get colonists up and down the Atlantic seaboard to be participating in this public ritual, to be hearing sermons on the revolutionary cause from their pulpits. And so in that sense, Congress really made it a political ritual. And what's also really interesting about the declaration of a day of fasting and prayer by Congress in 1775, and they did it almost every year after throughout the duration of the war, is that this was in many ways a statement about Congress's right to govern. Before this time, the privilege of declaring days of public fasting and prayer was one that was typically reserved for the king or for governors. And so in essence, by breaking this protocol, Congress was signaling to its would-be constituents that they intended to stand as a governing body for these united colonies. Were these fast days successful? I mean, would you tell us what these days achieved and whether all the congressmen in the Continental Congress agreed that proclaiming these days was a good idea? Yeah, so we see what Congress hoped they would achieve. And in many ways, Fast days are directly related to two of the main problems that Congress faced at its inception. The question of its legitimacy. Was it a legitimate governing body? And there were many critics, you know, who not surprisingly became loyalists in the war that said that Congress was an illegal Congress, that it had no right to form or to try to organize resistance to Great Britain. And then Congress had the problem of how do we overcome the traditional familiarity of local politics? Colonial America, people tended to know who their political leaders were. They knew them because they were familiar to them. Not to say that they were in the same social class. Political leaders were the elites of colonial society. But, I mean, on election day, they'd buy them drinks. 
they knew who their leaders were. They were familiar with them. And now we have this new national governing body with names that are unfamiliar. And it's almost like this group that they know exists in theory, but what role will it play in governing the day-to-day lives of individual Americans? And so Congress hoped that these fast days would help overcome these two problems. Essentially, by declaring days of fasting and prayer and by clergymen accepting that invitation, clergymen became extensions of the Continental Congress or adjuncts of the Congress. And merely by taking up the invitation to preach on the appointed fast day, they added to the perception of legitimacy for Congress in the eyes of many Americans. Furthermore, here Congress was able to have its message preached to Americans by local spiritual leaders that they knew and trusted. So as Congress looked at these, and as we look at some of the letters and writings of its delegates, we see these goals, and I think to a large extent they were successful. Yet one of the real challenges to researching and writing about this was trying to get the bottom-up view of these fast days. And I looked through hundreds of letters and diaries of clergymen and laypersons alike trying to ascertain exactly you know, what the public and popular response to these days was. And what we see is that at times they were very successful. And in certain places, they were very successful. And, and sometimes in some places, not so much. They were successful when the dangers of the war seemed imminent. So in New England, for instance, in the early days of the war, The British Army is there in New England, strong presence, a major threat, and we see a corresponding high degree of fervor in fast day observance. Yet once the British Army moves southward, we see that fervor, we see that excitement wane a little bit. We also see that when there are momentous periods of the war after a major victory or in the wake of a major defeat, fast day observance by average Americans is high. We also see that fast day observance was consistently high in urban settings as opposed to rural settings. And I think part of that is when you're in an urban setting, you never have loyalists and patriots living as close together as they are in a city. And so these public rituals, these fast day rituals were a way of them demonstrating very clearly where they stood in terms of their political allegiance by whether or not they observed these fast days. And so, you know, Congress had these goals, and I think to a large extent, they were successful. But of course, like any movement that starts from the top and moves down, there were certainly exceptions. In Pulpit and Nation, in your chapter on fast days, you noted that Congress used fast days to shape the narrative of the revolution as a fight between good and evil. And I wonder if you would talk to us about how Congress came up with that narrative and how they crafted that narrative through fast days. Yeah, what Congress, and really through their fast day proclamations and then the resultant sermons that clergymen would preach, were able to kind of translate the justifications of the war, translate them from the terms of international law and enlightenment reason that really, when we think about it, are much more effective with elite, well-educated circles of colonists. And through these fast days and through this revolutionary preaching by clergymen, they were able to translate the justifications for the war into religious terms, to make it about the moral redemption of mankind, to make it about the maintaining of providential favor. So Great Britain had long celebrated itself as kind of the bastion of Protestant religion and that God favored them among all other European nations because they were the guardians of Protestant Christianity. At least that's how they portrayed it. Yet in the imperial crisis that became the American Revolution, we see them trying to grapple with these terms. How do we resist the government that we have long celebrated as possessing the favor of God, of possessing the favor of providence? And so we see in the fast day sermons that preceded the Declaration of Independence in 1776, we see clergymen being a little bit careful with their language, essentially suggesting that if Great Britain persists on its present course, essentially that if Great Britain continues to levy these taxes and other acts that the colonists were not in favor of, that they stood in risk of losing their providential favor. And then, of course, after independence, 
these clergymen are outright declaring that Great Britain has lost its providential favor, that it was up to Americans to successfully wage this war for independence so that they could become the true inheritors of this providential favor. So essentially, they said Great Britain was designated to have a central role in the last era of God's plan for the moral redemption of mankind. They've lost that role. It's now up to us to take that role, to assume that all-important position in you know, the history of mankind. And by doing so, I think they really took what were rather esoteric considerations and made them religious in a very general sense. And in essence, I argue they were able to convince average common men to face bullets for considerations that were really part of an elite power struggle. So thus far, we've talked a lot about the work that clergymen did from the pulpit, how they encouraged people to support the revolution and to participate in congressionally sponsored fast days. But clergymen didn't just preach from the pulpit during the revolution. They also joined the ranks of the Continental Congress and of the Continental Army. So, Spencer, would you tell us about the role chaplains played in these revolutionary bodies? Yes. Now, chaplains were not uniquely American, of course. They had existed in Western legislative bodies and in Western armies for quite some time. The British had them on their side of the revolutionary struggle. But what we see in the American instance is that chaplains played an expanded role. Now, in Congress, chaplains prayed and preached for what I argue are two principal reasons beyond the traditional roles of chaplains. One of those was the promotion of civil discourse between the delegates. We have this story from the Constitutional Convention in 1787, where Benjamin Franklin actually tells us about some of the reasons that they had chaplains pray in Congress. There was this particularly contentious moment in the Constitutional Convention, and Benjamin Franklin makes this motion to start the daily sessions of the convention with prayer to invite a clergyman in as a chaplain to pray. And he tells the members of that convention that when he was in the Continental Congress early in the Revolutionary War, that this act was key to maintaining civil discourse between the delegates. And so we see this idea in Congress that they're realizing, hey, we're not getting along on a lot of issues. Maybe if we start each session each day with a prayer by a chaplain, things will get better. And sure enough, they did. And whether or not that was because of the prayers offered by the chaplains, we'll never know. But there were several members of the Continental Congress who, in their letters, called it a masterly stroke of policy. They thought it was brilliant that it worked wonders. But we also see chaplains in Congress projecting this image to the people who were out of doors, people who were not in the state house, projecting the image of a legislative body that was seeking to align itself and its actions with the will of God. Whether it was genuine or not, they were projecting this image much the same way that the federal government holds an annual day of prayer. In our times, it's about projecting this image. And then in the army, though, we see the major expanded role of chaplains was this expectation that they would help keep Americans in the war. In the British Army, which was filled with professional soldiers, chaplains mainly served the purpose of leading Sunday worship services and administering last rites to dying men. But in the Continental Army, which was made up essentially of volunteers, I mean, they were being paid, but these weren't professional soldiers. The chaplain's role was expanded, and some of the persistent problems that the Continental Army faced were desertion, soldiers leaving, just deciding to go home, and those who were hesitant to re-enlist after the term of their service was up or to enlist in the first place. For instance, John Adams has correspondence with some of the leaders of the Continental Army in which they talk about one of the problems they're having getting young men to enlist is that their parents are worried that if they send their sons into the army, they will become morally corrupted. And so John Adams works out this plan to say, well, what if we get more clergymen to serve as chaplains? Then we can assure the parents of these young men that they will have spiritual leaders watching over you know, their moral behavior while they're in the army. When desertion seemed imminent, whether it was dissatisfaction with living conditions in camp, whether it was Congress being consistently late in paying soldiers for their service, We often see leaders and officers in the army turning to their chaplains 
to preach to the soldiers about the duty of keeping the oaths they made of the importance of the revolutionary cause and essentially trying to keep them in the war by keeping them in the army. And so we see this expansion of the chaplaincy, both in American Congresses, but also in the American army. We know from speaking with other historians that choosing and declaring a political allegiance during the war for independence was a really difficult choice for most Americans to make. It was so difficult, in fact, that many Americans tried not to choose a side. They tried to remain neutral. So, Spencer, as we continue to grapple with this question of how Americans chose sides during the revolution, I wonder if you could tell us how clergymen specifically approached this difficult choice. As it was for regular Americans, it was often a difficult choice for many clergymen. And I think perhaps more so than any other group were the Anglican ministers. Because as priests in the Church of England, they had made as part of their ordination oath not only to be loyal to the church, but to be loyal to the head of the church, who was the king. And this really came to head in many places when it came to the liturgy of the Church of England as it was presented and followed in the colonies. There were some who very quickly after the war began crossed the king's name out of the prayers they would offer and inserted Congress's name instead. And there were clergymen who were willing to do this because they were patriots, they were supporting the revolutionary cause. There were others who may have sympathized with the revolutionary cause, but this would essentially be not only treason, but breaking their oath as ministers in the Church of England. So it was extremely complex, and there were a lot of different reasons for making the choices of either loyalty or rebellion or anywhere in between. But I think that there are two clergymen in particular whose stories show that sometimes as difficult and important as the decision between loyalty and revolution were, often it was about how you navigated the consequences that came after the choice that made the biggest difference in a person's fate after the war. And we see this, I think, most clearly in the cases of Samuel C. Berry of both New York and Connecticut and Reverend James Madison. But this isn't the man who became the fourth president of the United States. This is his cousin who just shared the name. And Reverend James Madison was of Virginia. And just real briefly, I mean, C. Berry was the arch loyalist of the American clergy, never for a moment does he appear to have even considered the complaints of American colonists to be just, and from the very beginning declared that the Continental Congress was an illegal Congress. And he sided so clearly with the Loyalists that there's never any question about where he stood. And then James Madison, on the other hand, was the newest faculty member at the College of William and Mary. had only been on faculty for two years when the rest of the faculty was either dismissed or return to England because they were all loyalists. So essentially, he became the president of the college after just two years on the faculty, simply through attrition. Yet both men, after the American Revolution, thrived in their professions. James Madison became the first Episcopal bishop of Virginia, and Samuel Seabury became the first Episcopal bishop of Connecticut. And, you know, at first glance, this is kind of a head scratcher because we have this idea not only of the patriots being those who won and the loyalists being those who lost, but essentially we sometimes are prone to talk about the revolution almost as a horse race. If you bet on the winning horse, things turned out really well for you in the aftermath. If you bet on the losing horse, not so much. But for Samuel Seabury, he was fine. And part of that is, is he was able to find leverage in the form of his ordination as a bishop in Scotland in the final years of the war. He received this ordination, returned to the newly independent United States, and began ordaining clergymen to serve throughout the northeastern United States in the newly formed Episcopal Church. And so as much as many of the patriots disliked Samuel Seabury, they realized that if they refused to include him in the governance of their new national church, they would essentially be getting rid not only of him, but of the dozens of clergymen he had ordained and potentially losing the participation in the church of Connecticut and New York and some of these other states. And so what we realize, at least in juxtaposing the experiences of Reverend James Madison and Reverend Samuel Seabury, 
is that, yes, the choice between loyalty and rebellion mattered and it was difficult. But if you could navigate the tumult that followed that choice, you could have been a loyalist and still, at least in Seabury's case, have done very well for yourself after the revolution. From what you just described, it sounds like if any group was predisposed to remain loyal to Great Britain, it was Anglicans. Do you think that's an accurate statement, given what you found during your research for Pulpit and Nation? I think for the most part, that stands as a general rule that among the American clergy, the Anglicans were far more likely to be loyalists. There are some exceptions, most notably would be Virginia. And some historians have argued that the reason we see more Anglican ministers support the revolution in Virginia is because Virginia had more homegrown clergymen than other colonies did, whereas the Anglican ministers in Massachusetts were usually coming from either other colonies or coming from England itself. In Virginia, there were far more clergymen who were born and raised in Virginia, became clergymen, but they were at a personal level much more connected to the fate of essentially their home colony, their homeland. Now, the end of the revolution didn't mean the end to clergymen's participation in politics. In the early republic, they continued to be in the thick of things. Spencer, would you tell us how the clergy participated in the ratification debates over the Constitution of 1787? Yeah, and I find this so fascinating because at least in the 21st century in the United States, there's people who have created this myth around the Constitution. In many ways, they view it almost as scripture, as this religious document. Yet, when you look at the Constitution, it doesn't talk about God, and it barely talks at all about religion. Clergymen did not participate in the Constitutional Convention, not as delegates. And as I mentioned with Benjamin Franklin's motion in that convention to have clergymen begin sessions with prayer, he was voted down. They didn't even want the clergy to come in and pray to begin the meetings of the Constitutional Convention. So we see in that convention very little that would suggest any religious significance for the Constitution itself. But where we see religion playing a significant role, as you mentioned, is in the debates over the ratification of the Constitution. And we see clergymen engaging in these debates, and we see political leaders alluding to Scripture and using religious rhetoric and biblical symbolism to make their arguments either for or against ratification. And we see this happening for different reasons, though. Some clergymen and religiously inclined Americans opposed ratification quite simply because the document made no mention of God. They thought it would be offensive to God because they don't mention or acknowledge him in the text of the document. Some men opposed ratification because it allowed, at least in theory, religious liberty, and they didn't think this was a good thing. They wanted to keep the dissenting Protestant denominations that were becoming more popular than ever. They wanted to keep them down in favor of their established or state-sponsored denominations. Of course, some people looked at that and for the same reason said, no, the religious liberty that at least in theory is promised in this constitution is a good thing. We should support ratification. You see ministers such as the Baptist clergyman in Massachusetts, Isaac Backus, who, I mean, this was reason enough for him to accept nomination as a delegate to the Massachusetts Ratification Convention. And interestingly, we see some clergymen and religious Americans who were hesitant to support the Constitution because it had a prohibition of religious test as requirements for federal office holding, meaning your religious preference could not be used to block you from holding office in the federal government. And they would argue that in a future time, this might mean we would have a Catholic president, a Jewish president, a Muslim president, or even an atheist president. And they saw this as unacceptable. And so we see religious reasons for and against ratification. And there was never really any consensus. But I think at the end of the day, and we don't have hard and fast numbers on any of this, but I think we see more clergymen supporting ratification than not. But there were clear objections, there were clear questions about it. And while the Constitution then has very little in it that makes it inherently religious, I think what we see in the ratification debate and clergymen's role in those debates is that Americans were keenly aware that its adoption would have an impact on American religious life. And so their debates over ratification centered on the impact the Constitution would have on American religious life. 
You just noted that some of the clergy worried that the Constitution might pave the way for a Jewish president or a Catholic president or someone else who was a member of one of those dissenting Protestant sects. Was it from these ideas and concerns where the myth that the United States should have a Christian president developed? You know, in part, it's interesting you would mention that because while I was researching and writing this book, it was in the wake of the presidential election of 2008 and the presidential election of 2012. And we see religion come up in those two elections. In 2008, there were those who were saying Barack Obama shouldn't be our president, and they were falsely claiming that he was a closet Muslim, or they were insisting that he was a radical Christian under the influence of Pastor Jeremiah Wright. And then in 2012, Romney was criticized by his own political party, saying he wasn't Christian enough because he was a Mormon. And so all this was happening as I was researching and writing this book, and it got me asking that very question, where does this extra constitutional idea that seems so pervasive among segments of American society today come from this extra constitutional expectation that the president should be Christian? And what we really see happening is that in the election of 1800, we see really the crystallization of this expectation among some Americans. But it came in the form not of constitutional theory, but of partisan politics. The Federalists who were seeking to reelect John Adams realized his record wasn't strong enough to essentially make that the center point of their campaign. And so they, among other things, attacked Jefferson on matters of his religion. He was reputed to be a deist. He believed in God, but didn't believe in Christianity, didn't believe that God intervened in the affairs of mankind. And they used this to call him an atheist and say, we can't have him be president because he's an atheist. And it failed. Jefferson won election. And despite all the Federalist dire warnings, the country did all right. It didn't fall apart. So in the short term, the Federalist plan to prevent Jefferson's election based on a religious argument backfired. It didn't work. But I think what has persisted since that moment among certain segments of the American population is this myth that the president must be Christian, even though the Constitution explicitly states that that requirement, at least in a legal sense, that you can't prevent someone from being president because of his or her religious beliefs. To go back to the Constitution for a moment, when we think of religion in the United States, many of us think of the First Amendment to the Constitution, which promises that Congress shall make no law establishing a religion or that prohibits the free exercise thereof. I mean, constitutionally, religion and politics seem to be separated in the United States. So what did Americans think about the participation of clergymen in politics during the early Republic era? You know, it was mixed. You're right. We have this idea at least these popular notions that we have this total separation of church and state, of the religious from the political, at least in theory. There were some early American leaders who were adamant about that. They believed there should be a clear separation between the two. And then there were others, Samuel Adams, for instance, John Jay would be another, and they actively promoted a mixing of the two. And I think this is so fascinating because what we see actually is the creation of an enduring American tradition. There was never consensus among the founding generation of the proper balance between religion and politics, or I should say the right or desired amount of religious expression, of religious participation in political matters. We see this, for instance, at the very beginning in 1775, when John Zubli, a Lutheran clergyman from Georgia, is elected a member of Congress. Now, John Adams, for instance, he was all in favor of this alliance between the Continental Congress and clergymen, but he was not so thrilled at the idea of having a clergyman serve as a delegate to Congress. And even writes to his wife, Abigail Adams, that mixing the sacred character with that of the statesman is not attended with any good effects, essentially saying these men will not make good politicians. And there's much more harm to be done by clergymen serving in political office than in merely having them preach politics from their pulpits. Essentially, he was in favor of mixing religion and politics, but not mixing statesmen and clergymen. But we also see in the ratification debates another example where the Federalists, for instance, would in their newspapers, they would celebrate how many clergymen had endorsed the Constitution as a sign that it was 
God's intent that the American people ratify the new constitution. And sometimes in the very next paragraph in these newspapers, they would criticize the clergymen who opposed ratification, telling them that it was wrong for them to meddle in politics, that they should stay out of it and stick to the things of God. And so, you know, we see them talking out of both sides of their mouth. And we see the beginning of this enduring American tradition of when clergymen and spiritual leaders speak out on political matters in ways that we agree with, we welcome their commentary. But when they speak out in ways that are in opposition to our respective political positions, we essentially tell them to stay out of it. That started with the founding generation and it continues to this day. At the end of Pulpit Nation, Spencer states that religion never purified the politics in America's founding era. If anything, politics tainted religion. Spencer, would you tell us what you mean by that? How did politics taint early American religion? It's the first line of my concluding section of my book. And I remember when I wrote it, and I I hoped it would provoke conversation because I think it really asks readers to rethink the traditional narratives of religion in the founding era. And as much as we talk about the religious and the secular occupying inherently separate spheres, we see that in reality, they were actually dependent on each other. They built upon each other, worked against each other. It's hard to ever fully say, here is the religious, here is the secular, and there's this clear line between them, particularly when we're talking about motives, when we're talking about the motives of the people who shaped the American nation. But I think it's very easy for us to get caught into this trap of thinking that when people are acting in the political sphere, we readily acknowledge that they are motivated to at least some extent by power. You know, they're seeking power, they're seeking influence. Yet we tend sometimes to be less skeptical of those operating in the so-called religious sphere of clergymen. We seem to see their motives as seeking morality and the improvement of mankind. Whether we agree with their religious doctrines or not, we tend to say the clergyman's occupation is one of genuinely seeking to improve society, while the politician's profession is one of seeking power and influence. And in writing that line and the conclusion that follows, I wanted to kind of just put it out there as messy as this actually was, that as clergymen, if you engage in the political system, you are essentially bringing upon yourself reasonably the same suspicions that the public has for the motives of their political leaders. That essentially, it becomes much more difficult when we see the interplay between the religious and the political in the politics of the founding era to have this clear dichotomy of, you know, good objectives or good motives of seeking morality on the religious side. And it's about power on the political side. And we see power at play on both sides. We see this desire to strengthen one's position in society on both sides of this so-called political secular divide. And so I wanted to emphasize this interplay, this ambiguity, and make it messy because it was messy. And as historians, we're up against some really well-established historical myths about religion in the founding era. You know, there are people who speak of America's decline as being the result of having less religion in government. But what serious examinations of the era and its surviving sources reveal to us is that this is a myth, that religion did not make revolutionary era politics somehow more pure than they are today. And in turn, revolutionary politics did not leave American religious life by any means unadulterated either. Let's get into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Congress had not asked and encouraged clergymen to play a role in the American Revolution? How would the lack of fast days and army chaplains have affected the outcome of the American Revolution and its war for independence? That's a really fun question. And it's tempting for me to go for the exceptionally provocative answer and say that the revolutionaries' bid for independence would have failed if they hadn't involved clergymen, that independence would not have been realized, that the colonists would have lost the war. But I'll resist. At the end of the day, I think that might be going a little too far. 
it certainly could have been the case. But I think what I can say with a larger degree of confidence is that without the partnership that revolutionary leaders forged with their clerical counterparts, the Revolutionary War would have been much more difficult to prosecute. And early national leaders would have found the American people much more difficult to mobilize into action. You know, I've mentioned that clergymen played this key intermediary role in between elites and common men and women by translating justifications for the war into religious terms. We've talked about how clergymen helped establish the legitimacy of the Continental Congress, helped get their message out to the people. We saw how they served as chaplains. And while they didn't always succeed in keeping Americans in the war, we do know that more Americans fought and more Americans stayed in the army because of the role of the clergymen than otherwise would have. So I think that without the strategic alliance, you know, project this alternate future in which the revolution would at least have been more difficult to win. And even to the point that the Americans may not have won the war without the help of clergymen. So Spencer... Now that you've explored intersections between religion and politics during the revolution, what are you researching now? So I'm taking a lot of the same themes I explored in Pulpit and Nation and and examining how some of them played out in later periods of American history and with religious groups that we tend to think of as being outside mainstream Protestant Christianity. So in addition to my work on the Joseph Smith papers, I'm working on three different projects, each of which I'm really excited about. The first is another book-length project. It's a book on Joseph Smith, the controversial Mormon leader, on his ill-fated and little-known presidential campaign in 1844, and what that campaign can teach us about the political obstacles to uh, universal religious liberty in 19th century America and today. I'm working on a documentary history of New York's burned over district that I'm creating in partnership with Jennifer Dorsey, who's at Siena College. And then the third project is a collection of essays that I'm co-editing on the perceptions of Mormons in American political culture. And that book is currently under contract with Cornell University Press. So I have these three projects. I'm really enjoying each one of them and really enjoying taking these themes of religion and politics and how they intersect and looking at additional areas of the American past. You're a busy historian, Spencer. If you have any time to fit us in, where should we look for information about how to contact you? The easiest way to keep up with my projects and speaking and writing would certainly be my personal website, spencerwmcbride.com. You can also reach out to me on Twitter. My handle is at Spencer W. McBride, or you can email me. My email is listed on the contact page of my website. Spencer McBride, thank you for helping us explore the roles that clergymen played during the American Revolution. Thank you so much, Liz. American clergymen have always held a lot of political influence, especially within their local communities. So it's really no wonder that the Continental Congress turned to clergymen to help them with the revolution and its war effort. As Spencer related, the American Revolution created a lasting national political stage, and many secular leaders wanted the help of religious leaders on this stage. Because clergymen had the ability to greatly help members of Congress and local committees gather support for the revolution. They did this by translating the causes of the revolution from international law and enlightenment reasoning into religious terms terms that non-educated, non-elite Americans understood and could stand behind. Plus, clergymen also served the cause as congressional and military chaplains, service which helped them soften the differences between congressmen, kept men in the army, and helped convince reluctant parents that they should let their sons join the army to fight. Perhaps it's no wonder then, with all this service, plus their long experience as community thought leaders, that clergymen didn't want to stop participating in politics after the revolution. Of course, as Spencer related, after the revolution and the ratification of the Constitution of 1787, many lay Americans were rethinking the participation of clergymen in politics. In fact, it's a thought that many of us still may be thinking about. Because in the United States, religion and politics have never been completely separate. Just think about our election cycle. Elections lead people to ask questions about the religious beliefs of their candidates. Candidates seek endorsements from popular clergymen and women. And religious groups spend lots of money on advertisements seeking to force candidates to debate or take a stance on issues that those groups think are important. So, as you can see, the intersections between religion and politics, which started long before the American Revolution, 
are intersections that continue to live on into our present day. Look for more information about Spencer, his book, Pulpit Nation, plus notes for what we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 134. Support for today's episode came from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The Omohundro Institute is an organization that promotes the study of early American history in all its vastness. And one of the major ways the Omohundro Institute does this is by publishing the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. Now, what makes the William & Mary Quarterly the leading journal of early American history is not only does it publish top new research in the field in a highly accessible and often fun-to-read manner, it also cultivates and nurtures that work. How does it do this? Take a listen to episode 105, where William & Mary Quarterly editor Joshua Piker takes us on a behind-the-scenes tour of the William & Mary Quarterly and shows us just how the journal earned its title of the leading journal of early American history. Finally, what do you think about the ways that religion and politics have and do commingle in the United States? Send your thoughts to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.